Well, it looks like I'm back to talking about Fire Emblem again. Now in the past, I've discussed various different aspects of the Fire Emblem series. Things like classes, certain characters, bosses, chapters, the list goes on. Well today, I'm tackling one of the most important aspects of the Fire Emblem series to date. Support conversations. The characters in Fire Emblem are the strongest part of the series, and certain characters can support with each other in order to find out more about the characters' personality and backstories, as well as how they can support each other and often change the ending of the game, and what the characters do once the entire war is over. Now because of how many different characters there are throughout the series, each support conversation is unique and shows a different aspect of each character, which can result in either a hilarious or heartfelt conversation as a result. And today, this is what this list is all about, as I count down my top 15 Fire Emblem supports slash romances. Originally, I was going to do a top 10 list, but when looking over all the supports I've experienced throughout the series, there were just some conversations I simply couldn't leave out this countdown, so in the end I just said, fuck it, it's a top 15 list ladies and gentlemen, and this list was requested by the YouTube users Zerk Monster Hunter 4, Emily Kitten, and sorry if I mispronounced this, Daniel Chang. Now before we get started, I have to stress, and I mean really stress, that this list is purely opinion based. And because of the subject matter at hand, deciding on the best support conversations is incredibly subjective. Everyone has their own views and opinions on what writing or good dialogue is, so I can guarantee that a lot of you will question or disagree with the support conversations on this list. But hey, that's perfectly fine. Also, these supports aren't all just romances. I mean, a good chunk of them are. But some of them are just supports between friends. Just wanted to throw that out there. Also, I'm limiting it to only one support conversation per character, since certain characters have many of the best support conversations in the series, and I didn't want this list just to be about one character's conversations with everyone else. Also, I know this is going to annoy certain people, and I myself aren't too happy about this, but I'm not including any Robin supports, since Robin can support with every character in Awakening, and as such, he slash she can access a lot of really good support conversations, and Robin would completely dominate this list if he or she was included. Also, if you've seen any of my other Fire Emblem videos, you would know that his support with Sumia would have easily taken the number one spot because, well, you guys know how I feel about Sumia, which is another reason I have no Robin support. Also, this is another point I really have to stress. Because I have not played the Japan exclusive Fire Emblem games or Fire Emblem Fates yet, I'm not including any of the support conversation from those games because there is a big difference between actually playing the games and watching your characters grow and support each other rather than simply looking up the conversations on the internet. Also, I'm not including Shadow Dragon and Radiant Dawn on this countdown, since outside of the recruitment conversations and the occasional conversation between certain characters, Shadow Dragon doesn't have any supports, and in the case of Radiant Dawn, the support conversations are awful. I'm serious, they're atrocious. So for this list, I'm only looking at the supports in Fire Emblem Blazing Sword, Sacred Stones, Path of Radiance, and Awakening. And with that all cleared up, let us all sit down, have something to drink, and talk about each other and discuss our problems, just like in Fire Emblem. Or in the case of Awakening, let's eat some motherfucking pie! Being a knight forces you to show no signs of fear and be ready to face the enemy at all times. As such, a lot of the best knights show no signs of emotion or any sort of change in their appearance in order to focus and stay calm at all times. So you'd think that having two of the best knights in the continent of Magbell talking to each other would be like watching two lifeless robots exchange pointless information, but in the case of these particular knights, they tend to act the most human around each other despite their duties and even experience the magic that is love. Who are these knights you ask? Well ladies and gentlemen, at number 15 we have none other than Gilliam and Serene. <laughs> I find the support conversations between these two to be the most underappreciated support conversations ever. I mean granted you get Serene rather late into the game so I'd understand why you wouldn't really use her and thus support with anyone, but man I really did not expect the support between these two to flesh them out so much. Gilliam and Serene's support revolves around them reminiscing about their early days in the army and how far both of them have come since then. We see throughout their supports that Gilliam is rather overprotective of Serene, constantly telling her not to be a hero and that he'll be the one to look out for her. And in turn, Serene teaches Gilliam about listening to people's problems and hearing what they have to say. Since everyone is currently at war, so naturally people are going to be scared, and just listening to them can provide comfort. Adding to this is that despite being knights and having duties to perform, they always go out of their way to look out for each other, constantly wanting to protect one another and acting the most human when they're together. In fact, if the conversation reaches A level, Gilliam asks Serene to marry him once the war is over, and she says yes without having to think twice, which makes them want to get through this war together even more. 
I know this isn't the strongest support conversation in Sacred Stones, but I just happen to like the support so much. Perhaps it's the way these two act around each other, or the fact that I got to see a more human side of my favourite general in Fire Emblem, but I really like it. Being a knight comes with a lot of responsibility, and you must always put on a brave face when you're around others. But the support between Gilliam and Serene shows us that even people like this have their human sides, and even something as heavy as being a knight can't stop people from falling in love with each other. Because of how the story in Fire Emblem Awakening unfolds, the children that come back from the future aren't exactly the happiest bunch of people, though it makes sense given the lives they've had to live up to this point. I mean, not all the children are like this, but I'd say a good 70% certainly have a lot of weight to carry on their shoulders. So what happens when you take the most Sundere Fire Emblem character of all time and pair her up with the Fire Emblem equivalent to Batman? Well my friend, what you get is a surprisingly heartwarming romance between these two. <laughs> Truth be told, this was not what I was expecting in terms of a support conversation when I paired these two together. But I'm not going to lie, I'm really glad I did since the support is not only a strong romance between these characters, but it reveals a lot more about Jerome's backstory. The main point of this support conversation is that Severa wants to know why Jerome wears that mask. He tells her it's to conceal his emotions from his enemies, which makes sense, but Severa is determined to find out the real reason as to why he wears it. And given Severa's attitude towards people, Jerome isn't exactly willing to comply that easily. After pressing on and on, Jerome eventually reveals that he wears the mask because when he was young, he wanted to become a warrior and he thought that wearing a mask would make him look cool. Translation? I'm Batman. Severa calls him out as being lame, but Jerome insists that's the truth. Once they reach s rank support level, something incredible happens. Oh my god, Jerome took his mask off. Yes, yeah, Severa's shocked as well. After the initial shock to the system, Jerome tells Severa that that's the real reason he wears the mask, because he loves her and is very sensitive to what she says and he doesn't know how to act around Severa, and thus the mask helps him keep his cool. In fact, Severa's reason for wanting him to take his mask off is because she loves him and wants him to take his mask off so she can learn more about him. This support conversation really did a lot to finish out Jerome's character and it really helped to see him in a new light, as well as where his reason for wearing the mask came from. And even though it doesn't do much to flesh out Severa, she still has some great lines throughout their support, and just seeing these antisocial teams with angst and parent issues get along so well is rather heartwarming, which is why I love the support between these two. The scene Jerome without his mask is really surreal in all honesty. In the Fire Emblem series, there are often various different species of beastmen or the goose throughout the series, though dragons are often considered to be the strongest and the most dangerous, and why wouldn't they be? They're fucking dragons. Anyway, because of this, the dragon and the goose can pretty much take on any enemy without even having to lift so much as a finger when compared to the other types of the goose, especially the Tugul since, well, they're giant bunny rabbits. But what happens when you turn this type of situation on its head, with the dragon being the weak one and the bunny being the strong one? You get the support conversation between Yarn and Na. I feel the support between these two characters acts not only as a strong romance, but I feel it does a fantastic job of developing both these characters compared to their other support conversations. The central theme around the support between these two is that, naturally, Yarn is scared of everything around him, and Nard tells him to man the fuck up, or bunny the fuck up in this case. Which is not exactly easy, as Yarn expresses his frustration at not being able to turn into something as powerful as a dragon, and how being a bunny isn't going to scare off anyone. But Nard expresses that being a bunny has its duties, and that dragons have their fair share of issues as well. Yarn still complains about his predicament and how he's the last of his species, and Nard eventually gives in and tells him to man the fuck up. Anyway, once the support reaches A level, Yarn goes to talk to Na, only to discover she's been taken hostage by bandits and quickly fights them off to rescue her. Afterwards, Na tells Yarn that he was rather ferocious back there, and even Yarn couldn't believe it himself. Once the support reaches S rank level, we find out that Na is having nightmares about the incident, since it was the first time she's felt so powerless and vulnerable, and Yarn swears to protect her since the incident with the bandits made him realise he loved her and would do anything to keep her safe. 
I feel the support between these two really helps them to look at the world in different perspectives. Because of the kidnapping, Jan has never felt so powerful in his life, and Nal has never felt so vulnerable. Something neither of them had experienced up until this point, and now it's something both of them can relate to. I also like how they discuss the pros and cons of being a Tagul and a Maniketi, since though the Tagul are much weaker, they're very fast and useful for escaping or quick attacks, and that being a dragon can be difficult since you're such a big target to everyone else. I feel this support conversation really goes to capture the true essence of what a support conversation in Fire Emblem should be, since the relationship between Yan and Na is about how they support each other in times of need, and how each of them now look at the world in a different way, and I think it's really sweet, though I don't think a bunny dragon hybrid is the best idea in the world. Have you ever heard of the phrase, actions speak louder than words? Well that statement certainly holds true for this particular couple, since though they don't share much dialogue through their supports, what they say, and their actions, is what makes the support between them so strong, and is a shining example of less is more. And these two are none other than Lin and Raph from Blazing Sword. <laughs> Oh god, I bet everyone's thinking, dude, it should be Lin and Hector, their relationship is totally 100% canon, why you do this to us? Firstly, yes, I think Lin and Hector are totally canon in terms of overall romance. However, most of this comes from the cutscenes rather than the support conversations. As such, I find the supports between Raph and Lin to be overall stronger. The supports between Lin and Raph revolve around Lin wanting to know why Raph is so quiet, even when compared to men like her father, and Raph's response to this is as always. Naturally. Eventually, as Lin opens up more to Raph and tells him about her feelings, Raph tells Lin about his backstory and that because he was the Chifferton's son, it was his duty to prevent a foreseen disaster. As such, even at 4 years of age, he was constantly ridiculed and laughed at, and at times he thinks back to just how lonely he was. Lin tells him that she can sympathise with this as she has felt the same type of loneliness, and that by being around Raph, she can gain strength from someone who knows what she's been through. Again, this support doesn't have much in terms of dialogue, but you can feel the emotion between these two, since they both experience the loneliness that doesn't compare to anyone else, and given Lin's situation being the last member of her clan, Raph is the type of person she feels the most secure and comfortable around despite his quiet stance. Which is why I like their support so much. Both of these two have life experience that doesn't compare to anyone else, and by supporting each other, they can both find comfort and solitude around each other. Like I said before, in certain cases actions speak louder than words, and that certainly holds true for the relationship between both Raph and Lin. Since though their dialogue is rather small compared to most Fire Emblem conversations, what they say makes the greatest amount of impact and thus lands at the number 12 spot of best Fire Emblem supports. Nervousness around the opposite sex is rather common and understandable. Naturally, people who have extreme cases of this have to take this very slowly around others and become more confident bit by bit in order to overcome this fear. So what happens when you take the two most nervous characters around the opposite sex and make them support together? Well, as a matter of fact, they act really natural. This type of support conversation is the last thing you'd expect from these two characters, given their personalities, yet surprisingly they act so normal around each other, to the point in which it makes it seem that they didn't have any issues to begin with. For those who don't know what I'm talking about, both Lonku and Olivia are very fearful of the opposite gender. Lonku can't be within 10 feet of another woman, and Olivia is so unbelievably shy you swear that her hair was blushing all the time. Anyway, the support conversation between these two revolves around Lonku trying to slice a barrel of water in two without causing it to shatter, to sadly no avail. Olivia tries to help Lonku by instructing him on how Basilio does it, but even still, it doesn't work. Eventually, Olivia figures out the problem and does the unthinkable. She holds Lonku's hand and they slice the bow together, causing it to split clean in half. Lonku then realises what was wrong all this time. He put no heart into his strikes and thus couldn't use his blade properly, and only by having Olivia at his side and in his heart could he achieve this. Right from the very start, both of these two have no problem talking to each other or being in the same room together. They act just like anyone else would act, and by supporting together, they become even less fearful, to the point in which they can both hold hands together and be as close to each other as possible. I just think this type of support is both hilarious and adorable. 
Just seeing these two otherwise paranoid individuals get along so well is both hilarious and heartwarming, since they both know what it's like to be fearful of the opposite sex, which is most likely why they can talk to each other so naturally unlike everyone else, and by the end they come so far as to fall in love with each other. Though I find it odd that the main reason for this support was because Longku was wanting to know how Vasilia's technique worked, and Olivia knew the details of said technique. Do you think this guy planned it all from the beginning? That sneaky bastard. The main characters in Fire Emblem tend to have some of the longest and most in-depth support conversations out of all the characters. This makes sense considering the main characters, or lords in Fire Emblem, are the most fleshed out characters so naturally their support conversations would be a lot longer and more in depth than most other support conversations. This certainly holds true for number 10 on this list, since because these two characters are some of the main characters in Path of Radiance, their support conversation is very complex and very in depth. Granted the support focuses more on one character compared to the other, nevertheless the support conversation in question is between Ike and Seren. <laughs> You know how RPGs are often criticised for having way too much text? You know, the type of games we have to read for ages and go through pages worth of dialogue and exposition to the point in which you might as well just read all three Lord of the Rings books? Well, I can surrender support conversation is a shining example of this. Not that that's a bad thing though. I will admit, this support conversation is more in favour of Seren than Ike, but it's still a great support conversation nonetheless. The support conversation doesn't start out as much, Seren simply notices Ike is exhausted by the twitching in his eyes and he needs to rest and Ike comments that Seren is a big softy. B level support is where things get more interesting, as Ike notices that Seren has been rather moody for days, though truth be told, in Path of Radiance, Seren had one hell of a stick up his ass. Seren tries to change the topic by commenting that Ike never worries about who he is or his family, and Ike agrees he's got no complaints. Seren then expresses his sadness not being able to have loving parents or experience a proper childhood, since the person who raised Seren wasn't his birth mother and she hated raising him, in fact she hated everything about him. Hmm, that sounds familiar. Eventually, when Seren was four, he was gladly given away to a sage and the sage put Seren through intense magical training and after two years, the sage died and Seren was left to fend for himself. Once the conversation reaches A-level, shit starts to get real as Seren reveals to Ike that he is a Branded, which is a cross between a Bjork and a Laguz and because of this, he was hated by both the Laguz and the Bjork equally. After explaining everything to Ike, he simply says, So? Seren questions him on this and Ike explains he doesn't care if he's a Branded, what matters is that he is Seren and he is his friend. This support conversation really delves into Seren's backstory and explains so much about him, and considering the shit he's been through, his attitude throughout Path of Radiance makes sense, and even though Ike doesn't say much throughout this support conversation, what he says to Seren helps to strengthen their relationship and helps Seren to become less insecure. Because Ike has no bias, no racism, and sees people for who they are and not what they are, and he sees Seren as his friend, not a branded. Despite the heavy exposition dub, this support conversation really focused on the idea of friendship and being open-minded towards others, since Ike's attitudes towards Seren and people in general is what helps Seren to be less insecure about himself and accept who he is. And before anyone asks, yes, I do ship Ike and Seren. The things people experience in life help to shape who they are. Sometimes the best experiences in life can define the person you're going to be and other times the worst experiences in life will help you to realise your mistakes or work towards never having to go through that experience again. This certainly holds true for number 9 on this list since both these two have had life changing experiences that help to define who they are as well as how they plan to spend the rest of their lives and it just so happens that they both appear in chapter 10 or 13 of Fire Emblem Sacred Stones. Yes, it's none other than Garrick and Tethys. <laughs> I don't know why exactly, but I find the support between Tethys and Garrick to be the most natural and realistic support conversation in Fire Emblem. Perhaps it's the way they exchange small quips and jokes towards each other, or maybe it's the history these two have together. Regardless, the support between Garrick and Tethys begins with them talking about Tethys' dancing skills and some happy banter between the two. Garrick then asks Tethys when she started dancing, to which Tethys hesitates to tell him until they reach B-level support. This is when Tethys explains that both her and Yuan were abandoned by their parents and were forced to live with nothing. 
Tetes couldn't live like that, and so after observing a local dancer, she began copying her moves. And even though it was very difficult, she never gave up because it kept her brother smiling, and it's thanks to that she became the woman she is today. A-level support is where we find out about Garrick's backstory, in which he used to be an arrogant mercenary, until one day he challenged a knight who was far better than him, and suffered a crushing defeat as well as ending up with a scar on his face. What, did he challenge this guy? That was the first time Garrick was truly scared, and the knight could see that in his eyes, so he let him go. It was thanks to that experience that Garrick's eyes were opened to just how weak he really was and it's haunted him ever since, but Tenface explains that his defeat was a good thing. Since because of it, he is still alive and all the joy that has come afterwards is a result of that experience. In fact, if Garrick wasn't spared, he never would have even met Tenface. Similar to Rap and Lin, it was thanks to these experiences that these two shared in life which helped to define who they are today. Yes, their lives were hard, but it was those tough times that made these two who they are, as well as a reminder of how either determination or overconfidence can greatly affect your future. Once again, like Lin and Rap, I love the support between these two because they have life experience that no one else has and they can easily identify and sympathize with each other. Their support conversation not only expands both their characters' backstories, but it also builds very strong romance between these two and they're one of my favorite couples in the Fire Emblem series. Naturally, because most if not all Fire Emblem games are about war and the horrors that come with it, a lot of characters are rather serious and a bit down on the entire situation. However, the younger units tend to be a lot more cheerful and optimistic. I mean, that makes sense, they have the whole youthful optimism or naivety or whatever you want to call it, and these characters tend to have very cute, often adorable support conversations. Well, once again, we have yet another support conversation from Sacred Stones, from two units who are not only some of the youngest units in the Renius army, but also share an interesting teacher-student parallel, and these two are the Knights Franz and Amelia. <laughs> Franz and Amelia definitely have one of the best all-around support conversations in the sense that they have equal amounts of character development and backstory, but they also play a big part in both these characters' overall story arcs throughout the entire game. The support conversation between Franz and Amelia technically starts in Chapter 9, where Franz recruits Amelia after Amelia tries to fight him but trips up instead, which is something Franz is very familiar with and he tells Amelia the truth about either Ephraim or Erica and she decides to join the team. This is where the support conversation really begins, since Franz, after seeing that Emilio is fitting in very well with the others, declares her as his rival. No, not that type of rival. Or that. Or that. Or that. Or that. Anyway, they are rivals in the sense that they will constantly work hard to become better than each other. Franz's reason for this is that his brothers were rivals and even though they fought against each other, they still have respect for each other. Amelia isn't too confident at first since she lacks skill, but Franz tells her that he has the same problem, which is why they're best suited for each other. Support level B is where we start getting into their backstories, since Amelia explains that she was born in a rural village in the Greater Empire and takes great pride in her country, which is why when Grado invaded Renius, she wanted to be a part of the fight, despite not understanding the reasons for this war in the first place, which is something Franz can easily understand. Support level A shows even more backstory, since it is here that we find out that Amelia's mother was taken by bandits as she couldn't do anything to help because she was weak, and it was because of this that she wanted to become a soldier and become stronger, and not to be alone anymore. Franz once again can sympathise with this, since he doesn't know either of his parents, but he lives every day to his fullest just like Amelia, and together they head towards the same goal, and they swear to each other that they will protect one another and never be alone again. These two are honestly just a really sweet couple. I mean, both of them are on the same page in terms of skill and experience, and they walk the same path. But it's the way they comfort each other, and by knowing and acknowledging their weaknesses is what makes their support so special. Also, this support helps to show Francis' progression from the student to the mentor, since he is now the one giving advice to a fellow soldier and looking out for her. All in all, Franz and Amelia have one of the most complete and all-around best supports in Sacred Stones, expanding the characters' backstories and personal story arts, as well as having a very sweet romance between such a cute couple. But the next couple on this list are just so cute. Have you ever seen two characters that you just took one look at and said, Oh yeah, I totally ship these two together. It doesn't matter what their personality is or motivation or backstory is, these two just make such a cute couple that they should be together. Well, that was certainly the case with these two characters, since once I recruited both of them in Path of Radiance, all I needed was one glance and I thought to myself, oh yeah, I'm totally having these two support together. And oh man was I ever glad I did. Since not only are these two a cute couple at face value, but they also have a very sweet support conversation, and even quite a bit of character development that's more subtle than most support conversations. 
You may have already guessed it by now, but at number 7 we have Ileana and Zira from Fire Emblem Path of Radiance. <laughs> What can I say, I'm a sucker for adorableness. Admittedly, the support between Ileana and Dark isn't as well written as some of the previous supports, but it's still a really good support and once again these two are just so darn adorable together. The support between Ileana and Zerok revolves around Ileana, as always, starving for food despite eating more than Goku, Luffy, Akame and pretty much every shonen protagonist in anime. Anyway, Ileana approaches Zerok noticing that he has food on him. She tries to ask him for some but Zerok doesn't seem to get the gist of it and questions Ileana's eating habits. At support level B, Zorok notices that Ileana once again is starving and he is still baffled by this. Even Ileana doesn't know why she eats so much yet is never full despite eating enough to feed 5 people and once again she tries to get food from Zorok but he doesn't quite catch on and she comments that he's the only one who hasn't given food to her. Support level A is where the support gets really good. Zorok runs into Ileana again and comments that she's really cute Aww. and that once again she's hungry. In fact, Zerot states that Ileana is popular with the men because of her cute charms, and that's how she gets food from people. However, she doesn't remember the names of the people who feed her. Granted, Ileana explains that she collapses into a coma when she's not fed, so she has to take what food she can, but Zerot stresses that she should at least remember the names of the people who fed her, and at the end of it, he treats Ileana to dinner since he feels bad about preaching to her, and Ileana is eternally grateful to Zerot. The support conversation is not only really cute and funny, but the A-level support really improves both these characters, since despite being rather strict with her, Zorok is a very kind-hearted person and is more than happy to help Ileana so long as she shows appreciation for what others do, and this leads into how this improves Ileana as a character, since even though she doesn't intentionally forget people's names, Zorok's lesson teaches her that even the smallest gestures should be appreciated by remembering the people who helped you, which is a life lesson I think everyone should learn. In fact, this conversation carries over into Radiant Dawn, this is when they run into each other in Radiant Dawn Part 1, since she instantly remembers who Zerok is and all he did for her in Path of Radiance, and in Part 3 she convinces him to rejoin the Grail Mercenaries. Honestly, the romance between Ileana and Zerok is just so damn adorable. It may not be the best written or most in-depth, but it's so sweet and I love these two characters so much, and I'm really glad that they addressed their relationship in Radiant Dawn. But I'm also really annoyed that they didn't have proper supports in Radiant Dawn in order for this romance to go further. I mean, come on, these two should have got married at the end of the game and given birth to such beautiful babies. Like I mentioned before, a lot of the children in Fire Emblem Awakening aren't exactly the happiest bunch of people in the world, but it makes sense given their situation. However, they're not all like that. In fact, there are two children in particular who are some of the most upbeat and cheerful characters in the Fire Emblem series. These two are constantly smiling, laughing and spouting some of the most over-the-top and theatrical lines ever. They both strive to be heroes of justice, defending the innocent and at the same time, referencing other Fire Emblem games. And now that the cat's out of the bag, number 6 on this list is Cynthia and Wayne. <laughs> I swear you can make a TV show about these two talking non-stop and I would watch it non-stop. The support between Cynthia and Wayne is just so damn hilarious and over the top but it's also really sweet and I really like the romance they are going for them since it's more or less the whole childhood friend angle. Cynthia and Wayne's support is about how when they were younger they were both played Justice Cabal. Cynthia then tells Wayne that she is planning on her next grand entrance into the battlefield. Wayne believes that the best way is to show up at the last minute right before all hope seems lost yet Cynthia insists that she should be there from the very start. With B support, Cynthia asks why you'd want to wait until the last minute to save people since it might not work, and Wayne tells her that that's exactly the point, since he feels that the sacrifice of a dear friend will fuel his heroic rage and allow him to become the most powerful warrior ever as he hungers for blood and destroys everyone on the battlefield, and that the hero has now become the Dark Avenger. By the way, you might want to change that title dude or Disney is going to sue your ass. Anyway, after going all out and telling Cynthia about the whole friend sacrifice and Dark Avenger ordeal, he decides that instead of lying in wait, he will charge into battle at Cynthia's side. He explains that the reason he and Cynthia wanted to become heroes in the first place is because of their parents, and now that he's back in the past, he has a chance to protect them, and if he lies in wait in the background, he can do no such thing, and by being together they can both be heroes of legend. I swear, this support is something that really has to be experienced to fully understand. 
Just seeing the tangents these two go off on and their different views on heroism is some of the most fun I've had with any Fire Emblem support conversation and I think these two make such a cute couple since they're so optimistic and over the top they're practically made for each other. Everyone's got different views on what a hero is. I mean there's the hero of justice, the anti-hero, the tragic hero, the superhero, the silent hero, the sonic heroes, sort of. But when it comes to Fire Emblem, both Cynthia and Wayne are my heroes and their support conversation is more than worthy of taking the number 6 spot. Revenge is something that may sound like a good idea at first, but it's a vicious cycle that ends in nothing but pain and misery for everyone. Gundam Seed said it best, one person kills for revenge and that person is killed out of revenge and the cycle just constantly repeats itself. Many different stories have tackled the idea of revenge and the Fire Emblem series is no exception to this. A lot of character motivations are fueled by revenge and entire story arcs could be based around it. For example, Cormag and Joshua want revenge on Kaliak and Valter, Kron wants revenge on Gangrel, and Ike wants revenge on the Black Knight. Often other characters will try to persuade people off the path of revenge in order to prevent further suffering and Fire Emblem 7 does this brilliantly as the supports between these characters not only help to prevent one of them following the bitter path of revenge but by doing so shows the lengths these two will go to for each other because of their friendship and these two characters are none other than Raven and Lucius. <laughs> If it wasn't for the fact that you've got three lords present throughout Blazing Sword, you'd swear that these two were the main characters of Blazing Sword considering how deep and fleshed out their character and story arcs are, you could essentially make an entire game based around them, or at the very least a side story. Like with Franz and Amelia, the support between these two really begins with chapter 16-17 of Blazing Sword, where Raven and Lucius are prisoners until Raven decides he's fighting for the enemy despite Lucius' plea, until he is recruited by his sister Priscilla. The reason for him siding with the enemy is due to the fact that the House of Ostia was responsible for the death of his family and because of that he wants revenge on them by taking down Hector. In support level C, Lucius wants to know if there's any way to change Raven's mind. Raven naturally says there isn't despite the fact that he knows getting revenge will not bring his parents back and will only bring Rice to more hate. But unlike Lucius, he doesn't have the strength in his heart to simply forgive and forget. In support level B, Raven tells Lucius to leave him if he refuses to let him exact his revenge. Lucius then suddenly snaps and insists that Raven should give up his lust for revenge. Raven tries to silence Lucius but he will not do as such because Lucius knows the type of person Raven truly is and getting revenge isn't like him. Raven is rather shocked by the outburst but he tells Lucius he and Priscilla are the only family he's got left and he doesn't want Lucius to come with him so that he doesn't get hurt and he doesn't want to lose him. At support level A, Raven begins to question the events surrounding Ostia's actions since Eliwood, Lynn and Hector have been very kind to Lucius. Raven realises that because he was so distraught at the time, he believed all the rumours going round and let revenge fill his head and his heart without properly thinking things through. It's at this point that Raven decides he will abandon his quest for revenge and find out the truth about what happened, but he wants to do this alone so that he can return to Lucius and have someone to come home to. I feel this support conversation, aside from very cleverly tackling the idea of revenge, really shows the power of friendship and the lengths true friends will go to for one another. I mean these two don't always get along but you can tell that they care deeply for each other and that the support conversation helps change Raven for the better and because of it Lucius has never been happier. There's even hints at a homosexual romance between these two with Lucius saying that Raven should get a wife so he could look forward to coming back to her but Raven says that Lucius practically is his wife because of the way he nags and gibbers at him. They say that love has the power to change people's hearts and thwart any evil. While the support between Raven and Lucius isn't exactly about how the power of love can change people, but how the power of friendship can help people to look at things from a different perspective and stop them from making a huge mistake they're sure to regret. Speaking of the power of love... Like with its previous support, the support conversation and story arc surrounding these two characters is enough to take up a decent chunk of the game. In fact it did, since in Fire Emblem Blazing Sword, these two characters are seen many times before the chapter you recruit them and the support conversations they have to further expand their already deep relationship and story arc is a prime example of how love can change even the blackest of hearts. If you haven't guessed by now, I'm talking about Nino and Jafar. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, the support conversation between Nino and Jafar can best be described as Fire Emblem's version of Beauty and the Beast, only with no singing. 
These two fall into a grey area of importance on the overall story, since they have much more bearing on the plot than pretty much every other Fire Emblem unit you can recruit in Blazing Sword, but they're not the central focus of the storyline like the Free Lords. As such, Nino and Javar have a decent chunk of the game dedicated to their story arcs, but afterwards it's up to you to have these two support together in order to see how it turns out in the end. In terms of the game's overall story, Nino is Sonya's adopted daughter and is the sister of the brothers Lloyd and Linnaeus. Unlike most of the Black Clan, Nina is very sweet and kind-hearted and does whatever she can to earn her mother's praise. Bitch! Jafar is the complete opposite. He is one of Nagal's most powerful soldiers and is a cold, merciless killer, never questioning his orders and killing whoever is his next target. In fact, he's the one responsible for killing Leela. During the chapter Battle Before Dawn, or as most people call it, the worst chapter in Blazing Sword, Nina is tasked with assassinating Sophia, and Jafar is tasked with killing her once the job is done. However, neither of them can fulfill their duties and thus they leave the Black Fang and join the lead within the gang, much to the dismay of Hector and Matthew. After learning the truth about Nina's parents and giving Sonya the ass kicking she deserves, Nino and Jafar join the team for good and this is where the support begins. With support level C, Nino asks why Jafar joined Nagal in the first place and Jafar explains that as a child, Nagal selected him and raised him to become his angel of death and thus he had no thought or feeling, until he met Nino and saw her laughing with her brothers. And when she saved him, that was the first time he experienced any real emotion. In support level B, Nina gives Jafar a pendant that is very special to her, because it is stained with her mother's blood and is the only thing she has left of her. Jafar accepts the gift and acknowledges Nina as his best friend. Once they reach support level A, Jafar says he cannot be Nina's friend because things have changed. At first, Nina is so upset she starts panicking and making accusations, and then Jafar says he loves her. At first, Nina thinks he's joking, but it's pretty obvious that Jafar isn't the joking type. Nina finds it hard to believe, but she loves him as well, and they decide that once this war is over, they will live together in peace. Like I said, this is pretty much Fire Emblem's version of Beauty and the Beast, since Jafar was once a cold, black-hearted killer, and only thanks to Nino's love and compassion could he change his ways and learn to love. Nino and Jafar's story arc and support conversations feel like one giant story of tragedy and romance. Seeing the suffering that both these two go through throughout the game, only to fall in love by the end, is just like its own little fairy tale, and they end up living happily ever after. Hmm... Do you me a any chance to read one of these books? Well, we're at number 3 on this list, and once again we have another support from Fire Emblem Blazing Sword. Now this support is a bit more traditional than the others, since it's very much a Prince Falls in Love with Princess story, but like with the previous two supports, the way in which the support is built around their relationship in the game, and the story surrounding these two, makes the support so effective. Not to mention, these two are just such an adorable couple you can't help but sigh every time you see them. So without further ado, number 3 on this list are Eliwood and Ninian. I must say, Lee, would you certainly hit the jackpot when it comes to falling in love? I mean, aside from the fact that Ninian is ever so kind, beautiful, gentle, sweet, caring, selfless, and all around lovely, she is a dragon. Damn! I know, right? Still, I'll take Sumi over anyone else any day. Like I said before, the support between these two, while rather typical, makes for a very sweet romance and works really well alongside the conversations they have throughout the game that aren't support based. Major spoilers for Fire Emblem Blazing Sword's story though, so skip to this point in the video if you want to avoid spoilers. The support between the Leeward and Ninian takes place throughout the entire course of the game of Blazing Sword, and it begins in Chapter 7 of Lin's story, where Ninian is captured by bandits and the Leeward just so happens to stumble upon this damsel in distress and swiftly saves her. After completing Lin's story, the two part ways until Chapter 17, where they find Ninian adrift at sea, only to discover that she is suffering from the tired old cliché of amnesia. Anyway, once they reach the Dragon's Gate, Nachal tries to use her to open the Dragon's Gate, but Eliwood's father stops this and dies in the process. At this point, Ninian has all her memories back and feels responsible for the death of Eliwood's father, and even though she helps out on the battlefield, she feels she is not worthy of Eliwood's kindness. This is where the support conversations come in, since at support level C, Ninian wanted to thank Eliwood personally for all he's done during Lin's story. Eliwood says it's no trouble, but Ninian insists on thanking him properly. Ellie would ask if she would be so kind as to do a special dance just for him, to which she happily agrees. Though to be honest, I think Ellie was trying to hint at a lap dance. Giggity, giggity, giggity. Anyway, at support level B, Ellie would tells Ninian about a festival that takes place every year and how he would like her to join him since both his mother and father would dance the night away. 
Ninia seems excited about this, but she hesitates because she tells Libra that she's been deceiving him and can't bring herself to tell him how she feels. Support level 8 is where the true romance blossoms, since Ninian is still rather upset about last time and feels she is unworthy of being anywhere near a Leeward. A Leeward acknowledges that she has a secret she's kept from him, and that she cannot tell him what it is. But he doesn't mind. A Leeward says that he won't force her to tell him, but rather whenever she's ready she can, because he loves her, and no matter what secret she has, nothing will change that, and that Ninian is the first woman he's felt that way about. This support feels a lot like the support between Ike and Seren, only with it being more balanced and used for more romantic purposes, since even though Ninian has a side of her that she doesn't want Aliwa to know about, Aliwa doesn't mind in the slightest because he loves her. Throughout the course of the game, that stuff that happens to Ninian always has an effect on Aliwa for both good and bad, and because of this, Ninian felt she was never worthy of his love or kindness. But it doesn't matter what happens because Aliwa loves and will always love Ninian. Honestly, the love these two share is just so precious and I find them to be such a lovely and perfectly matched couple, almost like a match made in heaven. Which makes it all the more tragic when Aliwood accidentally kills Ninian after receiving the sword Durandel. Though in the end she comes back to life so it's all good. While this support isn't as dialogue heavy as a lot of the other supports, the romance between these two is one of the best in this series and is something I enjoy experiencing every time I play Blazing Sword. In fact, the romance between Aliwood and Ninian is canon in terms of continuity and she gives birth to Roy. So that means Roy is technically half dragon. In a fantasy style story, it's very common for the prince to get the princess. This is a storyline pretty much everyone is familiar with at this point, but it serves its purpose and is ideal for simple storytelling. When it comes to Fire Emblem, this particular support conversation isn't exactly the case of the prince gets the princess, but rather the princess falls for her most loyal and trusted knight, which is a good thing considering the prince and the princess are brother and sister. And because I suck at foreshadowing, number two on this list is the support between Erica and Seth. <laughs> Seth, who would have thought that you would end up falling in love with the very princess you sworn to protect? What well, was this part of the deal the day you signed the contract? Okay, let's see, I have to guard Erica at all times, get a mounted unit, and once the entire ordeal is over, I get to bang the princess. Sweet! In all honesty though, the support between Erica and Seth is very sweet and the romance is honest to god beautiful, especially if you decide to support them as early as possible because of their interactions with each other at the beginning of Sacred Stones. Allow me to explain myself. In the beginning of Sacred Stones, Grado attacks the Kingdom of Renias and Seth escorts Erica away from the castle before she could be taken prisoner. He even clashes heads with Valter and doesn't exactly come out on top. Now it's just Erica and Seth by themselves and they must find a way to reclaim their kingdom back from Grado. It's these parts of the game that focus a lot more on Seth and Erica's relationship, since after they reclaim their kingdom, the story focuses a lot more on other characters like Ephraim, Innis, and Larachelle, and Seth kind of takes a backseat until certain cutscenes. This is why I said you should support these two as early as possible, since the support between these two furthers the romance established at the beginning of the game, and by doing so, the romance has much more of an impact, as you are constantly seeing the love for these two grow and flourish over such a small amount of time. With support level C, Erica asks how Seth is doing despite his injuries against Valter. Seth tells her not to worry and that he is fine, but Erica doesn't believe him, because every time he raises his lance, he flickers slightly. Seth insists that it isn't a problem, but Erica asks him not to overexert himself, as she will not be able to continue her journey without him. B-level support begins with Erica and Seth sparring together and Seth acknowledges her improvements in her swordsmanship. Erica asks if he could teach her some techniques since she's learnt most of her fighting from her brother and by learning from a knight of Renia she could become even stronger. Seth suggests that Erica shouldn't worry too much about herself getting stronger but rather leave the fighting to him as he is her knight, but Erica believes that she simply cannot watch from afar and she should learn to fight properly for herself instead of relying on Seth for everything. A-level support is where the conversation gets a lot more meaty. It begins with Erica wanting to spar with Seth once again, but Seth is rather reluctant as he feels Erica has become too close to him since he is merely a knight and not royalty like Erica herself. He tells Erica that she should not favour one subject over another as she will be the one ruling the country, and if she is not prepared to send men off to die in battle for her, she cannot live up to her reputation as a noble. Erica understands this and apologises, but she explains that when they rode off that night, Seth held her so tight and he kept her safe. With both her brother and her father gone, she felt even closer to Seth and forgot her role as a Queen of Renius. In turn, Seth tells Erica that when he held her, he forgot all his sense of duties and that she was a queen, but rather that she was someone he wanted to protect and run away with, and for the first time, his heart took over his head. While it's not outright stated that they love each other, it's pretty damn obvious at this point. 
You can tell that Seth, despite his role as a knight, is protecting Erica because he loves her, not because it's his job. And in turn, Erica loves Seth despite him not being a prince or a noble. Once again, this is the case of who you are, not what you are. Since despite their differences in class and lineage, these two undoubtedly love each other, and despite the burdens they have to carry, their love is something they simply cannot abandon. In the end, Erica and Seth are one of my favourite couples in Fire Emblem, and they have my favourite set of supports in Fire Emblem Sacred Stones. Since their support doesn't tell you everything or paint a black and white picture, but rather gives you enough to interpret their relationship in your own way. And even if you don't ship these two, their support acts as a great way of improving character development and fleshing out their backstory, and thus landing them at the number 2 spot of best Fire Emblem supports, which just leaves the number 1 entry, and before anyone asks, yes, I totally 100% ship Seth and Erica, without a doubt. Oh boy, this is it. My number one support conversation in the Fire Emblem series. In this case, the support conversation in question must do something really special to make it past all the other supports on this list, and oh man did it ever. I mean, this support isn't even a romance, and these two characters are the last types of people you would want to support together based on what you know about them from their introductions. But this support not only acts as a fantastic case of character development and backstory, but it also helps to expand the lore surrounding the world of Tellius and tackles the theme of racism and how history is altered based on those in power. Number one on this list belongs to a support conversation in Fire Emblem Path of Radiance, and the support itself is between Lee Thi and my favourite women rider, Jill. <laughs> I swear I never would have thought that these two characters would have such amazing support conversations. In fact, if you would have told me that these two have the best supports in Fire Emblem before I myself experienced it, I simply would have laughed it off and said, Oh, sure thing, dude. Next you're going to tell me that the Black Knight is really General Zelgius. Well, I'll be damned. Talking seriously here for a minute, the support conversation between Li Thay and Jill really is the best support conversation in Fire Emblem because the way these two characters change and the amount we learn about both themselves and the history surrounding Tellius is something no other support conversation in Fire Emblem has pulled off as well as this one. Now the reason I say that this type of support isn't something I would expect from these characters is because when you first meet them, Li Thay is a very harsh Laguz with a tongue as sharp as a sword right now and a huge disdain for the Bjork. Jill is rather similar to Lethe in the sense that she is highly honour bound and is highly prejudiced towards the Laguz. And by highly prejudiced, I mean flat out racist. I mean the reason she was fighting with Ike in chapter 12 was because they're battling the Laguz in the first place. So naturally you don't want these two going anywhere near each other, but by having them support with each other, something rather unexpected occurs from both of them. In support level C, Jill awkwardly asks why Laguz don't use weapons and Lethe explains that Laguz are born fighters with their teeth and claws. Jill then asks why Laguz hate Bjork so much. Lethe wants to know why the Bjork hate the Laguz, and Jill says it's because they're enemies of the Bjork. And Lethe says, well if that's the case, the Bjork are the enemy of the Laguz, simple as. With support level B, Jill tells Lethe that she is having doubts because in Dayan she was taught that the Laguz attack humans without mercy and are just savages. Lethe says that's bullshit because the Laguz don't like humans and don't want anything to do with them. In fact, even mauling humans is considered unpleasant. Jill still finds this hard to believe since she's grown up with the idea that the Laguz are nothing but beasts, but after seeing Lethe fight alongside Ike and the others, she now begins to see them in a new light. In fact, she wonders why they even hate each other in the first place. Lethe isn't surprised as to why they hate each other, but this is all news to Jill, so Lethe explains that before there were only two nations, Benion and Goldoa, with Goldoa being the same as it always was and the other Laguz living in Benion with humans. For a while everything was fine, but the senators of Benion wanted nothing to do with the Laguz and thus declared war on them in the name of the Apostle. Why am I not surprised? And because the Laguz underestimated the humans, they suffered defeat after defeat until eventually the different Laguz tried to spread out onto the different continents. And this is the reason they fight and the reason they hate humans. All of this stuff is news to Jill since humans obviously altered history on purpose and she had no idea how to respond to this. With support level A, Lipe brings up the fight with Jill's father Shiharam and why she chose to fight against him rather than join him. Jill says that because of Ike and all the Grail mercenaries and the Laguz, she now knows the truth. And because of it, all of the events after joining the Grail Mercenaries have been of her choice and her decision. Before this, she did what Dayan asked of her and didn't question anything or bother to think twice. But now she has opened up her eyes and her heart to the truth and the people around her. Lifei then offers to shake Jill's hand as this is a Bjork custom, as Lifei now empathises with Jill and admires her strength, and even Lifei admits that if both her and Jill can understand each other, then maybe one day Bjork and the Goose can live in peace. Perfection. Just perfection. 
Honestly, the support conversation between Jill and Lethe gets everything right and really goes to show how listening to people and looking at things from a different perspective can change people's views on the world for the better. Before this, both of these two were fueled by hate and racism, but now they're shaking hands with one another and could even be considered friends. And that's why it's the number one support conversation in the Fire Emblem series, giving us a great amount of character development, backstory, world building, and real world issues that we can all relate to. In short, perfect. This has been Crash X500. I wish you guys a great night, take care, and thanks to all of those people who suggested that I make this list. It was a lot of fun to make, and it encompasses why we love the Fire Emblem series so much. In fact, I want to thank Zerk Monster Hunter 4 in particular, because not only were you one of the reasons for me making this countdown, but you're also the inspiration for my next countdown. How did you inspire me, you ask? Well, the clue's in the title.